Good evening. We greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. We welcome you to this Ash Wednesday service, a night when we, like our Lord Jesus, are humbled. We're humbled in the face of our own human likeness. This is a day where traditionally Christians are marked with ashes and hear the words, from dust you were made and from dust and to dust you shall return. It's an incredibly humbling gesture that Christians throughout the centuries have entered into, recognizing our limitations, our finiteness, the fact that we are mortals and God is not. This Ash Wednesday particularly, perhaps you are feeling the borders of those limitations pressing in in an especially particular way. This Ash Wednesday, we find ourselves limited by weather and circumstances, limited by pandemic conditions, by so many things. We are limited. We are finite creatures. And yet we serve a God who knows what it is to be human and to suffer with us. And so this Ash Wednesday, we're going to invite you in this service, um, in this service where we get to join together as a hilltop community. We would planned months ago to partner with Trevecca Nazarene University, so we're so grateful that we get to hear tonight from Chaplain Eric Gernand uh, and get to be led by some of the students at Trevecca Nazarene University in worship and song. So we get to join as a hilltop community. Um, even though we can't join physically together tonight, we get to join and lift up our voices in praise, um, lift up our voices in confession as we enter into this time of worship together. I want to invite you, since we can't receive ashes like we normally would on a traditional Ash Wednesday service, if you'd like to get a pen somewhere handy, maybe a a good erasable marker, something that washes off of skin easily, or even just a ballpoint pen. There's going to be a point in the service where we do invite you to still find a way to mark yourself, to mark yourself with a reminder of our own human limitations. Uh, we're going to get to hear from, from Pastor Eric in just a little bit, and it's going to be a rich night of worship in this Ash Wednesday service. But before we continue on, we want to pray the prayer that Christians have been praying for a very long time um, on Ash Wednesday, a prayer that was written by King David himself when he came face to face with his own sinful nature and human frailty. This is a prayer that comes from Psalm 51. So if you want to have your Bibles close by or handy, or just read along with us as we pray this prayer that King David taught us to pray. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me, against you, and you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are my God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. 
You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it, and you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Let's pray this prayer of confession together. Lord, we confess our sins before you. We confess that we have fallen short of your glory and your intent for our lives. Open our eyes that we may see ourselves with clarity and truthfulness, that we may have eyes to see all of that within us that is not pleasing to you. Lord, we confess to you that we have not loved as we ought. We have been impatient with others with whom we could have been patient. We have disregarded those you have called us to serve. We have chosen the selfish way when you have called us to selflessness. Lord, we confess that we have not tended to the care of our souls. We have been too busy to pray. We have been too quick to speak and too slow to listen for you. We have filled our lives with all kinds of noise instead of patiently waiting like sheep for our shepherd's voice. Lord, we confess our need of you. We need your grace. We need your patience. We need your guidance. We cannot see beyond the moment. We cannot worship you as we ought. As we begin this solemn journey toward the cross, we call upon your mercy and your love for our salvation. 
Let's continue to worship together. Is where you need us. Take me there, take me there. If what you need is just an offering, it's right here. My life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be dry by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, is my life. I want to be dry by fire, purified. You take whatever you Your glory wants to come in, let it fall, we want it all, your fire is consuming, fill this place, set it ablaze, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you, you're a fire. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, is my life. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you sacrifice I want to burn for you and only for you oh clean my hands and purify my heart I want to burn for you only for you take my life take my life as a sacrifice, I want to burn for you, only for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. Take whatever you desire Lord, here's my life I want to be dry by fire Purified You take whatever you desire Lord, here's my life Thank you so much for joining us for this Ash Wednesday time together. Today begins the season of Lent. Now the seasons of the Christian calendar, Advent, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, etc., they not only help us live into the rhythms of the Christian story, but they also give us a chance to acknowledge and to recognize God's saving activity that works across the wide range of human experiences. So Lent is this, this season of preparation for the celebration of Easter. It's the season where Christians around the world take up practices like fasting 
and repentance or giving something up for Lent. And, and it's where we seek to acknowledge our frailty before God and really our dependence upon God for life itself. Lent also gives us a chance to remember that life isn't all about gardens and rainbows and grapes and honey and empty tombs and outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's also about sackcloth and ashes. Not that we need a reminder of that reality these days. The truth is the signs of our frailty have been all around us and magnified intensely in this past year. We've lived through now more than a year of a global pandemic and the constant reminder of the, the frailty of our lives. We've spent the year learning about coronavirus and spike proteins and our vulnerability to a virus that I read the other day, if every piece of it was in the whole world was rounded up, it would fit inside of a Coke can and it's brought the world to its knees. Many of us have lost friends and family members. We've learned to watch case counts and hospitalization numbers and IT, ICU capacity. And then there's the plexiglass and the hand sanitizer and the physical distancing. There's probably no more present reminder of our frailty these days than the masks that we put on each day just to be around one another. Over the, over the past year, a lot of our attention has been directed towards ways we get out of the situation we're in. Vaccines, if everyone would wear a mask and social distance and wash hands and not touch our faces or herd immunity or whatever. How do we get out of this situation and secure our life? And listen, I hope we do come out of it soon. Even most of us introverts are ready to be around people again. But there's a temptation we all have in seasons like this. And I think it's one that we can fall into pretty easily as vulnerable human beings. This temptation to try to live as if we have some kind of ultimate power over death. That we can in some way, if we try hard enough, if we're smart enough, if we wrap ourselves in enough bubble wrap or something, that, that we can somehow hang on to our lives forever. And when we come face to face with the vulnerability of our lives, we want to find a way to secure ourselves. Or as Pastor Tim said the other day to me, when we, when we get into these moments, we always think we can solve death. And yet, the entire history of human experience, along with the loss of every loved one, reminds us that we don't have this power, that we are, in fact, dust and to dust we shall return. When we read the story of Jesus, we find that he begins carving out a whole new way to be in the world. Rather than hang on to, protect, secure his own life on earth, he lives it in faithful abandon to the God who actually does have power to give life. There's a passage in Luke's gospel that gets to the heart of this different way Jesus is making in the world towards a new and eternal life. Not long after Jesus' public ministry began, crowds started gathering around him. Wherever he went, people were being healed and restored and given hope and invited into a new way of life. He was teaching with this unique kind of authority that nobody had ever heard. There was a, a depth and authenticity uh, to him that nobody had ever seen. So the serious buzz surrounded him wherever he went. And, and naturally, the questions and whispers started moving throughout the communities. People were asking, who is this guy? <laughs> who, who is he? And, and in fact, one day in, in Luke's gospel, the story we're told is Jesus asks his disciple what folks are saying about him. Oh, they responded, um, you know, lots of people think you're a prophet reborn, like maybe John the Baptist or Elijah or some other ancient prophet. But then Jesus asked them the question, who do you say that I am? Now, I want to pause here for just a moment because there's a whole other sermon here to be preached, but can we at least just let that question sit for a second? It comes to each one of us 
at some point or another in our lives, and we have to grapple with it individually about what we believe about Jesus. Who do you say that he is? Well, at this point, Peter puts his opinion on the table. I think you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, this was a big announcement. The people of Israel had waited for generations for the promised Messiah who they believed would deliver Israel from their enemies, restore their fortunes, reunite the tribes, and usher God's dwelling back into their midst. Now, there were obviously different opinions about what exactly this deliverance would look like, but most of the theories included some kind of triumph over enemies, the restoration of the nation state of Israel, and the Messiah taking up an eternal kingship with an earthly throne. In other words, the Messiah was supposed to secure their life, their possessions, their community, and their kingdom here on earth. You can understand how a vulnerable people would want to put their hope here. Finally, someone has come along to help us beat back our vulnerability. But Jesus immediately acts to redirect the conversation. He tells them, keep it a secret, that he's going to be killed in a little while. And then he drops this on them in chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. Listen to this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit or lose their very self? The minute the disciples might be tempted to start dreaming of the time when life finally won't feel so fragile, when they'll have walls and armies and thrones and power, Jesus proceeds to tell them in that moment about the suffering, persecution, and death that he's going to experience, and that they should be prepared to experience with him as his followers. You know, we're not all that different from the disciples, are we? We often live in a posture of trying to secure our own lives and even beyond our physical life, our way of life. Instead, according to the man himself, if you want to be a part of the Jesus movement, be prepared to follow the way he makes to the kingdom of God. Instead of planning to be powerful, Prepare to put down your privilege. Rather than seeking safety and security, practice selfless love and sacrifice. In places of wealth and riches, carry the burdens of others. In other words, if you want to save your life, lay it down in love. There is a way to the indestructible, eternal kind of life, but it doesn't come through cheating death or by our own power and smarts. It comes, ironically, by laying our lives down, which is in one way what Lynn is sort of all about. It's about learning to loosen our grip in all sorts of small ways through fasting and repentance and etc. on these fragile and frail lives that God has given to us and learning to take up the way of, of the cross in return. And I wonder what that would look like for us as a community. If we redirected the energy it takes to try to secure our own lives or our way of life or our churches or our institutions or whatever it is that we try and grab onto and protect, and we just redirected all that energy into taking up the cross of Jesus, what would that look like in this season? What's something that you could lay down? And I would, I would love for us to think beyond like chocolate, right? Maybe for some of us, it looks like laying down our need to be right. For others, it looks like maybe venturing out and finding ways to connect with someone in need again. Or putting on a mask out of love for others who may be vulnerable or rejoining into patterns of church and community life that we've let stagnate as we've been separated physically. Maybe it's being willing to set 
your own opinion aside for a bit and live in someone else's shoes, learning to understand someone else's story. Possibly, it's redirecting some of the energy we've poured into following the news of the pandemic into carrying someone else's burden for a bit. I know that TCC is going to be experiencing this great practice uh, as a church through this season that I want to invite you to join into. They're, they have this cross-shaped table that will eventually become their communion table at the end of the season. And in the meantime, this table is going to be making its way to different places in Nashville to serve as a meeting place for people who have had different experiences of life and different stories to share so that they might find a chance to meet one another in love and reconciliation at the cross. Maybe you'll get to be a part of that or, or witness it or experience it or just take up the practice of doing the same kind of thing. Because whether or not the cross table shows up in your location, you and I can practice this self-giving way of life with one another. So I, I can't answer exactly what it might look like for you. We each have to ask ourselves before God, what is it? that we do in hopes that at the end of the day, we can hang on to our own way of life. And then whatever the answer to that is for each of us, I want to invite us to loosen our grip on it and let it go. The way to the indestructible eternal life of God isn't through hanging on to our own lives, but by laying them down. And trusting that God is faithful to share with us a more expansive, eternal life in return. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, giver of life and all that is, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the season of Lent that acknowledges the frailty of uh, life and creation and our radical dependence upon you for the sustaining of all life and for the hope of resurrection one day. God, we, we really do believe in your power to bring life and in your ability to teach us a way to live faithfully before you in the way of the cross of Jesus. We ask, God, that you're, by your Spirit, you would invite us to lay down and loosen the grip that we have trying to hang on to and secure our own life. And instead, God, that we would direct that energy toward the cross-style way of carrying others' burdens, of laying our life down in love for others of seeking to be reconciled to our brothers and sisters, of, of laying down our power and our privileges and our positions in order to meet one another in service and in love. God, throughout this season of Lent, may our practices of denial, of self, of carrying the cross with Jesus, of repentance, of being aware of our own sin and our own frailty. May these practices lead us to a deeper and more radical dependence and trust in you. We love you today, God, and we pray that as we receive the ashes tonight, that we would be reminded not just that we are dust and to dust that will return, but that all of the dust belongs to you, and you bring life from it all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. For a long, long time, Christians have come together on Ash Wednesday, and we've marked ourselves with ashes as a way of reminding ourselves every year that we are not self-made creatures. It's a way of putting ourselves back into that story again that God, from the very beginning, gathered dust together and breathed life into us. And so without that breath of God, without that gift of life, we are nothing more than ash. We are nothing more than dust. And part of what we're doing there is to remind ourselves that we are the kinds of people who entrust our future 
to God alone. We don't solve for our frailty. We don't strategize away out of the death that we might have to experience. We are the ones who simply trust ourselves to God's care. This year we had some really good plans put together to be able to put ashes on foreheads even in the midst of a global pandemic, and yet even those plans were laid bare by an ice storm. Yet just another example that we are frail creatures and we can't always plan our way out of certain circumstances. But the question that I think we ought to sit with tonight is the one that Eric has posed to us. What if we redirected all of that energy that we sometimes use of trying to make our circumstances be what we want them to be and instead redirect all of that energy into taking up the cross of Jesus? See, it was Jesus himself who entrusted his own future to the care of the Father. He didn't try to solve for the death that he was about to experience. Instead, he was going to go into it and say, Father, whatever you're going to do here, do it now. And so we followers of Jesus are the kinds of people who can't wiggle our way out of this frailty thing. We are contingent creatures and we depend upon God for our very life. And so as a marker of that, I invite you to take whatever marker you have, whatever pen or implement you have, and to go ahead and take a part of your body and to be able to make that sign of that cross there on your body. To signify that Jesus didn't move his way out of death, didn't try to solve for it, didn't try to wiggle his way out of it, but was able to enter into it while entrusting every bit of his future to the care of the Father. As you're marking that mark on your body tonight, I encourage you to hear these words. My brothers and my sisters, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. And in the meantime, my brothers and my sisters, let's trust the future that God is giving to us. Let's lean into the future that can only be given to us when we give ourselves away, and the future that can only come when we empty ourselves, when we pick up the cross, and when we walk the way of Jesus. Amen.